Hi, welcome to our first mini lecture for Chapter 4. Instead of using the Chapter 4 summary notes, I'm going to be using the Chapter 4 Essentials handout. If you have not printed this out, you may want to stop this video now, print it out, and come on back. Often students have trouble with this chapter, and that's why I wanted to focus on just the essentials in my mini lectures. It's easy to get lost in the details. Please do read the chapter and focus on understanding because memorizing will not work if you don't understand the underlying concepts. You won't be able to develop solutions when the situation or appearance of the problem changes. Okay, so let's start by taking a look at our accounting cycle. In chapters two and three, we learned how to analyze, journalize, and then post transactions into our accounts in the general ledger. And then we learned that at the end of the month, we're supposed to prepare a trial balance to make sure the accounts with debit balances equal the accounts with credit balances in total. And then we went right to preparing the financial statements. However, there's actually another step called preparing the adjusting journal entries. That's right here. And then after that, we prepare an adjusted trial balance before we prepare the financial statements. Now, why do we need adjusting entries? It's because of the accrual basis of accounting, which we've learned this semester and which we'll be using through the remainder of the semester. The accrual basis of accounting is based on the revenue recognition principle and the expense recognition principle. Just to remind you and refresh your memories, the revenue recognition principle states that we should record or recognize revenues when we fulfill the performance obligation. In other words, when goods or services are delivered. And we should recognize or record expenses when they are incurred. In other words, when we receive the benefit of a cost. Because of those two principles, at the end of the accounting period, our account balances may not be correct. We want to make sure revenues and expenses are recorded in the correct period and that the assets and liabilities will appear at the balance sheet on their corrected amount with, at their corrected amounts. So the purpose of adjusting entries is to make sure revenues and expenses get recorded in the correct accounting period and that assets and liabilities are reported at their corrected amounts on the financial statements. Essentially, you are just recording more revenues and expenses. Half of every adjusting entry will either be a debit to an expense account or a credit to a revenue. And the other half will depend on the type of adjusting entry it is. So let's flip to the next page. There are two types of adjusting journal entries, deferrals and accruals. Let's begin with the deferrals. To defer means to delay, correct? When cash happens too early, we have to delay recording a revenue or an expense. Why? Well, if we think back to Chapter 3, we learned that if we get paid before we deliver goods or services, we have to delay or defer recording revenue. We can't uh, credit a revenue account because we haven't earned it yet. So we record a deferred revenue, which is a liability, indicating in our accounting records that we owe our customers or clients the goods or services. Now that's what we learned in Chapter 3. But what if at the end of the accounting period, some of the goods and services have been delivered? Well, then we don't owe them anymore. And we really have earned that revenue. So we should do an adjusting journal entry, taking the amount earned out of the deferred revenue and putting it into service or sales revenue. And the same thing happens with expenses. If we pay for something, 
before we receive the benefit of the cost, then it isn't an expense yet. It's an asset. For example, supplies. If you pay for supplies now and you don't use them, if you use them later, then initially you have an economic future benefit. A future benefit is an asset. You haven't used them yet. You'll be using them in the future. Then, when you use the supplies up, you have received the benefit of that cost, so they become expenses, and your adjusting entry will move them out of the asset account supplies and into an expense account, supplies expense. So let's look at the handout, the deferral section. Okay, so it says deferrals during the accounting period, we had to postpone or defer recording a revenue because even though we got paid, we didn't deliver the goods or services yet. Instead, we recorded a deferred revenue or liability. And by the way, sometimes you may hear these referred to as unearned revenue instead of deferred revenue. They mean the same thing. They are both liability accounts. Or we had to delay or postpone recording an expense because even though we paid for it, we didn't receive the benefit of that cost. So instead, we record an asset, a prepaid expense. And supplies, by the way, is an example of a prepaid expense. So let's take a look at those initial journal entries where we had to delay recording a revenue or an expense. In our first example, we got paid, but we didn't do any work. So we increased the asset cash by debiting, but we increased the liability deferred revenue by crediting because we have not yet earned it. We owed our customers services or services for a period of six months. In our second situation on October 1st, we paid for rent ahead of time. We haven't even been there a month yet. This is October 1st. So the six months of rent that we paid out represents an asset, a future benefit. So we debit the asset account prepaid rent to increase that and we credit to decrease the cash account. So that's what we learned in Chapter 3. Now in Chapter 4, we learn the adjusting journal entry. Now it's December 31st, and revenue has been earned, and the benefit of the cost has been received. So we need to fix the balances in the deferred revenue and prepaid rent accounts. To figure out how much of that revenue we've earned, we'll assume that it's earned evenly. And so we can divide the $9,000 by six months, and that would be $1,500 per month. And if three months have passed, all of October, November, and December, we'll multiply that $1,500 by three months to give us 4,500. Now we are debiting the deferred revenue account because that's how we reduce liabilities. We no longer owe that customer or client three months worth of services. We've delivered them. And we can credit service revenue because we have earned it. Now let's take a look at the expense. Back on October 1st, we prepaid six months worth of rent, and that represented a future benefit, an asset. But now it's December 31st, so we've used up three months worth of rent. To find out how much we used up, we can take the full 6,000 and divide it by six months, and that is $1,000 per month. And between October 1st and December 31st, three full months have passed, so we would multiply the 1,000 per month times three, and we would reduce the prepaid rent account by crediting by 3,000, and because we've used it up, it has now become an expense, rent expense. Okay, so now let's take a look at accruals. That's the next section down. Accruals are simply revenues and expenses that have not yet been recorded 
So we're simply recording them, just like we did in Chapter 3. The difference is that no cash has been either received or paid yet. Cash has not happened yet. So you're going to be recording either a revenue or an expense as half of your transaction, and the other half is going to be a receivable if money is owed to you, or a payable if you're the one that owes the money. In our example, we have interest that's owed to us. And it won't be paid until later, but we have earned it in this period, so we have to record it as a revenue in, the, in this period so that our revenues will be reflected in the correct accounting period, and we have to show the asset interest receivable on the balance sheet. In our example below here, we have wages that are due to our employees. Why haven't we paid them? Well, because it isn't payday yet. But we want to make sure we get their wages in the month of December. So we calculate their wages, how many days they've worked for us since the last pay period, times how much a day, and we'll debit wages expense and credit wages payable. So sometimes there are revenues and expenses that at the end of the period have not yet been recorded, and it's our job to record them. And those are called accrual adjustments. Sometimes it's like our example of interest that you won't get paid that, that amount until later on, or maybe your service or sales department had not yet notified you of work that had been completed. And so you haven't sent out the bill yet. We have a receivable and a revenue. Or perhaps you haven't received a bill for landscaping or snow plowing. It comes right at the end of the month, so you're going to debit an expense and credit a payable. Again, half of this journal entry will be a debit to an expense or a credit to a revenue, and the other part will reflect the fact that cash hasn't happened yet. So it will be a payable or a receivable. The last example of an adjusting entry is actually a type of deferral. But it doesn't look like a deferral, so I usually talk about it separately. And it's on the next page of your essentials handout. It's called our depreciation adjustment. Let's look at the handout. It says, just the way we use up the asset supplies, and they become supplies expense when they're used up or received, the same thing happens with long-lived tangible assets such as buildings, equipment, computers, vehicles, etc. They get used up, and the portion that gets used up to help you generate revenues should be removed from the account and transferred into an expense account. That's in accordance with the expense recognition principle. And the process is called depreciation. The adjusting journal entry records as depreciation expense the portion of the cost that we estimate was used up during the current period. But instead of reducing the asset cost directly, like we do with supplies, we credit supplies to reduce them, we instead use an account called accumulated depreciation to subtract from the asset account. Now an account that subtracts from another account is called a contra account and it has the opposite type of balance. When we use this approach, we always preserve the original cost of the asset in the asset account and subtract the portion that's used up using the accumulated depreciation account. And that accumulated depreciation account keeps a running balance of all the depreciation recorded to that date. Then the difference between the cost and the accumulated depreciation is called our book value or our carrying value. Here's an example of what our journal entry looks like. We debit the depreciation expense account and credit the accumulated depreciation account for our estimate of how much that asset has been used up. And then on the balance sheet, we show the original cost less how much is worn out or been used up so far. That's our accumulated depreciation, and the difference is called our book or carrying value. 
Now, why do we use that accumulated depreciation account? Why can't we just credit the equipment account directly? Well, the difference between talking about a long-lived tangible asset like equipment or building versus supplies is that with supplies, we know exactly how much we've used up because we know how much we bought and then we can count what we have left and we just subtract to find the, find the difference. But depreciation expense is an estimate. And there are a number of ways to calculate it. We don't know how much of that equipment is being used up. We're making an estimate. What if we're wrong? We may have to extend the depreciation over a longer period or shorten the depreciation process in terms of how long we depreciate that asset if we're wrong. Also, by showing the original cost and subtracting the accumulated depreciation, readers get a better idea of the age and value of the equipment rather than just listing it for its reduced amount. And that number there should be 9,000 to match here. Remember, our whole purpose in producing our financial statements is to communicate to our financial statement users useful information so that they can make decisions about companies. Well, that ends our first mini lecture for Chapter 4. Feel free to go onto Blackboard and look at the problem demonstrations for adjusting journal entries.